Hi, and welcome to this special Ethics and Public Policy Center video event. My name is Fran Mayer. I'm a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and I'll be moderating today's discussion on the work of Augusto Del Noche. Del Noche, who died in 1989, has been described elsewhere as the most important thinker we don't know. He was a brilliant cultural critic, a committed Christian philosopher, and one of Italy's leading public intellectuals. He predicted the fall of Soviet communism and the sexual revolution with astonishing accuracy, as well as the rise of a new kind of technology-driven totalitarianism in Western culture. But his work was largely unknown to the English-speaking world until very recently. That began to change in 2015 with the appearance in English of Del Noche's book the, of essays, The Crisis of Modernity. In 2017, Del Noche's text, The Age of Secularization, was released in English. And on January 5th next month, Del Noche's book, The Problem of Atheism, arguably his most important book, and the book he considered the cornerstone of all his later thought, will finally appear in English as well. All of these books in English are the work of one excellent translator, Carlo Lancelotti, who joins us today along with two of my center colleagues. Carlo is professor of mathematics at the College of Staten Island and City University of New York and a member of Communion and Liberation. He's translated all three of Augusto Del Noche's work, Del Noche's work into English, including, as I just indicated, indicated most recently, The Problem of Atheism, and he's written and lectured extensively on Del Noche's thought and its cultural implica implications. Aaron Cariotti is a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, where he directs the program in Bioethics and American Democracy. He's also a professor of psychiatry at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, and director of the Medical Ethics Program at UCI Health. Dr. Cariotti is completing a book on Del Noche's thought and work. And Carl R. Truman is professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College and a fellow also at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in its Evangelicals and Civic Life program. His work focuses on helping policymakers better understand the roots of our cultural malaise. He's the author of the best-selling and award-winning 2020 book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, and his forthcoming book, Strange New World, will be published in March 2022. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Fran. Uh, uh, Carlo, I'm going to start with you, obviously, and then we'll get into a general discussion. Uh, you've now devoted about a decade of your life uh, to translating Augusto Del Noche. Uh, why don't you tell us who he was and what experiences shaped him? What would and also I'm very interested in what would draw a professor of mathematics and physics to the thought of a dead philosopher. Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation. Yes, you know, um, Del Noche was, by all universal reckoning, the leading Italian Catholic thinker of the second half of the 20th century. I think that's beyond dispute. Um, he was, in a sense, a a man from the generation after the after Maritain, you know, I mean, the, 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 the Catholic thinking in the early 20th century was really led by France, by people like Maritain and Jusson. And kind of Del Noche picked up their baton after the war, and he did extensive work on Catholics in the modern world, essentially. Since I am Catholic, I'm in the modern world, I thought it would be kind of interesting. I always find it very interesting. I mean, um, he was a kind of a solitary thinker because the, he was very isolated, I meaning that after World War II, the majority of uh, Italian Catholics, intellectual intellectuals, typically had some dream of a reconciliation with uh, political progressivism, or they were extreme integralists in some sense. The Noce was kind of a Christian Democrat, was somebody who thought that uh, modernity has to be answered from an original Catholic perspective without accommodating its mistakes, but at the same time, there is no going back, that one has to live with it and try to rescue what can be salvaged and uh, to try to help the situation in a, in a constructive way. So he was a very nuanced person. I always find him fascinating since my high school days, but probably the experience that mostly pushed me to translate him, even if it is not my job, is that, well, first of all, there was a sense of injustice because 
the Notch is clearly a brilliant thinker that was a captive of his language, meaning that he was never translated because he wrote in Italian. Italian is not a very translated language uh, for a number of reasons. And there is a sort of a chicken egg question that if you're not translated, nobody knows you. If nobody knows you, you are not translated. So I always felt that it was unjust. But there is a deeper reason, which is maybe more biographical for me, is that, you know, when I was a teenager in Italy, I kind of experienced the last big revolutionary ideological wave in Europe in the 20th century, the final flare-up of Marxism in the 1970s. And then I thought it was over. And then I ended up living in the United States. And then in the 1990s, I go, look, there is another one coming, another ideological semi-totalitarian or even totalitarian way. And so uh, suddenly the Noche seemed very relevant. And so that confirmed my intuition that it would be good to, good to translate him. Okay. So he's been dead 30 years. And I, this is a question for our other t uh, uh, two folks who are with us today. Um, Aaron and Carl, uh, why is he important for you? I mean, what, what made, what drew you to his thinking and what exactly is it that is relevant and important for an American audience now? Carl, why don't you go? Uh, for me, the thing that, that hooked me to Del Noche was the essay, The Ascendance of Eroticism, yeah. published in the, the first volume that Carlo translated. I was stunned by a couple of things in that. One, I was deeply struck by his predictive powers relative to gay marriage and religious freedom. That seemed to me a, a, a striking connection to be making in the early 70s when nobody was even talking about gay marriage at that point. Secondly, I was fascinated by his identification of the problem on the left as becoming that of psychological repression rather than economic repression. My grandfather was a lifelong socialist, a trade union man. If I'd ever asked my granddad what oppression looked like, it would have come down to jobs and money. Mm -hmm. He was a man of the old left and it was jobs and money. I was struck at Del Noche putting his finger on a, a problem, I think, in modern left-wing thinking that it has left its fingerprints on everything from uh, the gender wars uh, right the way through to to the more explicit aspects of the sexual revolution. So those were the two things that I found incredibly helpful in Del Noche. Parallel in some ways to, to stuff that I was reading at the time in Philip Reef. You know, Reef is, a, as far as I can work out, an agnostic Jewish thinker, but many of the same buttons are being pressed by Reef that were also being pressed by Del Noche at round about the same time. Uh, Aaron, what is driving you to write a book about yeah. Del Noche? So I, it's not your it's not your normal discipline. So I mean, what what is it that that is appealing to you? So I think I came at Del Noche also through some of the themes that that Carl mentioned. Uh, I saw also a resonance with Philip Reeve, who I had read in medical school and influenced my thinking, especially going into psychiatry. But I, as a bioethicist, I was also intrigued when I read his essays um, talking about the relationship between scientism or the, the non-scientific philosophical claim, or probably better put, assertion, that science is the only valid form of knowledge, and, um, and totalitarianism. He thought that there was this inevitable logical connection between a scientistic, not a scientific, but a scientistic ideology and um, and tendencies uh, toward uh, totalitarian forms of control and violence. And I think we can look around the world today, and, and I've been raising concerns recently in my own writing on uh, sort of biosecurity surveillance regime that I, that I see emerging worldwide. And by regime, I don't mean just uh, a government uh, controlled, uh, method of, of surveillance and security, but all kinds of institutions within society participating in this. And I think uh, their insights in Del Noche's work about the fundamental philosophical and metaphysical presuppositions that have been working themselves out certainly since the end of the Second World War and that go back even deeper into the philosophies of the 19th century uh, that we're seeing kind of play out now fully man manifest themselves uh, 
in in our own time. So so Del Noche was struggling with uh, problems in the 20th century. He began with the problem of violence. How did how did fascism grow up in in my own country, which is what he lived through as a young man, and he basically came to the conclusion that he had to look back into the 19th century uh, philosophies of history to, to Hegel, to Marx, to Comte, uh, to understand what was being played out historically in the 20th century. And I would argue that, that what began to play out historically in the 20th century um, is likely to become m- even more fully manifest in its kind of pure uh, sort of bourgeois uh, form in the in the 21st century, and I think Del Noche far, saw far enough down the horizon that he recognized that sort of the last word in in, in ideologies and the, the last word on the influence of of Marx and other 19th century philosophers was not the communist regimes of the 20th century, but the the affluent technocratic uh, society that we're seeing emerge worldwide in the 21st century. So I, I think he, he has a lot to teach us today about our own our own world and the relationship between between the history that's kind of developing um, in our own time and the ideas that are influencing it. Carlo, um, he, he did pick up on what uh, both Carl and Aaron are speaking about. The, one of the things that uh, Del Noche. One of the points Del Noche makes is the is the emergence of a kind of a Western totalitarianism, which, you know, uh, Sinclair Lewis, like eighty years ago, uh, wrote about a fascist regime in the United States, and it's completely implausible. And when you think about Zamyatin's "We" or "Brave New World" or nineteen eighty four, all of those things make interesting reading, but they don't really seem applicable to Western democratic culture. What did what exactly did he mean about totalitarianism? Uh, what kind of totalitarianism in Western culture was he talking about? Lucia gives a few different definitions of totalitarianism, but the one I find most uh, explanatory is the idea that politics invades every sphere of life and society, what he calls the absolutization of politics. Because then everything is judged politically, right? There is no question of the truth. The the criteria of evaluation becomes whether something favors the good side or say the revolution, progress, whatever, or the bad side. So in a sense, ethics is displaced by this idea of the direction of history, as the Noche calls it, that what is moral is what serves the direction of history. This ethics of the direction of history for the Noche is the definition of totalitarianism. I know it's a little obscure, but if you think about it, it does make sense. For the Noche, there is a very close association between totalitarianism and atheism, if atheism is correctly understood. Because uh, the, the big thing of this book is that atheists can be misunderstood. But the notion thing is that if you understand atheism in its most radical, consistent form, then political atheism is totalitarianism. It's a, the, the two words are synonyms. And it's not that because atheists are evil people, they're going to send the secret police and create concentration camps or anything. But because from a consistently atheistic worldview, which for the Noche found its first incarnation in Marx, uh, from a consistently atheistic worldview, power has to take precedence over truth. I mean, because ultimately uh, there is nothing wrong with us. I mean, the, once you get rid of the notion of original sin, which according to the Noche is the fundamental option that decides politics, whether we believe in original sin or not. Once you discard the notion of original sin, there is no limit to the power of improving the world. And so, uh, and there is no transcendent order of moral values that should restrain our actions. So what judges the value of an action is the ability to bring about change, political change, to improve the world, to make a difference. You know, all these worlds, if you think of it, are very common in our parlance today. Uh, today. People we talk about that all the time, but the implicit philosophical presupposition is that uh, truth is valuable if it serves change, if it serves improvement, if it serves progress. And uh, so from a, from a, a rigorous atheistic perspective, 
power must take precedence over truth. And when you accept this, then you are on the way to totalitarianism because there is no transcendent ethical anything that should stop you from bringing about, you know, again, change. And so uh, from this perspective, uh, atheism in its first incarnation realizes that itself as a revolution, where revolution is, if you wish, the opposite of uh, contemplation, is the opposite of tradition. Revolution is the collaboration to the direction of history towards its imminent fulfillment without God. And so you see where, where, where this is going, right? I mean, and that's why for him, totalitarians can take many forms. Totalitarians can take the, the form of the early 20th century in which he took the form of what he calls secular religions, right? Like Stalinism or Nazis. Mm -hmm. But you can also take other forms. If you, the, the common element ultimately is this absolutization of politics at the service of the direction of history. Based on this definition, many things, many forms can be totalitarian. And uh, Carl, you've got you, there one of his essays. I think I think it's in his. Uh, it, uh, it may be the age of secularization is on Catholic progressivism, and he talks extensively about uh, progressive Catholic thought and uh, its undermining of of uh, you know Catholic orthodoxy. I'm wondering if you have a similar experience in the Reform and the Protestant tradition. I mean, how are you how are you internalizing and digesting what? You know what Del Noche says in his work from a from a Protestant perspective. Yeah, it's it's hard to compare Protestantism to Catholicism because it's so diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, our progressives tend to be in other denominations to the one that I belong to, so it's right. it's difficult to 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 sort of compare directly. But I would say Protestant progressive Protestantism, even as it's emerging now in conservative circles, is increasingly wedded to two things. One, I think an imminent view of what salvation is. It's this worldly. Uh, and secondly, increasingly committed to therapeutic ideals, that the old proclamation of sin, hellfire, damnation, the sort of the characteristic of the evangelical revivalist, that's very passe now. Uh, more and more, it seems to me, discussions within Protestant churches operate along therapeutic kind of lines. So I would say, as, as I watch the progressive Catholic world, as I read some priests who live in Manhattan writing about certain things, uh, it seems to me that they are simply expressing through a Catholic idiom what yeah. I hear Protestant, progressive Protestants expressing mm -hmm. through a, a Protestant yeah. idiom. A loss of a loss of the sense of the transcendent, a loss of the sense of eternity as providing the context for understanding uh, our temporal world. Those would be the things right. that I would note. Mm -hmm. Aaron, the, what is the psychological effect of this trend? I mean, right. as a psychiatrist, you deal with it. I mean, what, what have you observed in, in, in uh, the impact of the emerging <clears throat> culture? Sure. Well, there's certainly a loss of uh, a sense of meaning, a sense of transcendent meaning, which has been alluded to already, but also the sense that everything in my life is instrumentalized. It's either instrumentally useful to increase my material biological sense of well-being or vitality, right, which is the characteristic kind of criteria in uh, the, the society of well-being that, that Del Noche described, where he said even religion itself can become a kind of vitalizing drug. I mean, it's, it's seen in the very same terms as something that I can take if it suits me um, and if it gives me a certain um, uh, sort of therapeutically induced feeling of well-being or vitality, uh, then I will make use of it. And... Del Noche considered this to be, in a sense, the highest form of blasphemy, to, to instrumentalize uh, truth, goodness, uh, beauty, and ultimately God in this way is basically turning the, the classical understanding of these things upside down on its head. And, and of course, for many people, religion will not give them that, that vitalizing sense, in which case it's, it's discarded as useless in the question of its truth never really arises. And, and this, is, this is something that Del Noche noticed that, again, he traced back to Marx, that for 
for Marx, uh, atheism was a postulate. It was a, a, a starting assumption going, uh, going back to the idea that if I'm dependent on God, I can't really be free. So Marx started mm-hmm. from uh, this notion that any form of dependence uh, will involve kind of subservience to, to a worldly Lord or to God. And so if man is going to be th- free, then he needs to re- radically reject any form of dependence. So atheism was taken as the cornerstone, the starting point. It wasn't argued for directly. Instead, what Marx said is if we arrange society in, in the right ways, then the whole question of God will disappear entirely, right? So the, the real threat to um, religious faith or religious belief today is not from the new atheists who are arguing that God does not exist, right? You, you, can, you can have a common starting point with people like that if you're a person of faith because both of you think the question of god is important it's one worth thinking about it's one worth arguing about it's one worth you know maybe screaming about on twitter but it's an important question whereas with with the contemporary forms of irreligion uh the idea is that we arrange society in such a way that the question of of god or meaning or purpose or truth never even arises in the first place. And I think, again, that's an element that Del Noche saw that after sort of what he called the decomposition of Marxist ideas in the late 20th century, that aspect of of Marxism still very much influences us, particularly in in the West, um, even more so perhaps than it did in Russia, which was more explicit about looking to uh, Marxist economic ideas or his ideas about uh, a, a, about a revolutionary movement um, that this this form of, of positive atheism, as Del Noche put it, uh, is still very much with us today. And um, and I think for for people of faith and communities of faith, it's important to understand that, in a sense, that's the real threat, um, that these questions never even arise in the first place. Um, mm-hmm. people don't feel the need to ask these questions because we've, we've arranged our lives in such a way, uh, that we have ignored or suppressed them almost entirely. Carl, I want to get back to you. Uh, you were, you were going to say something. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was going to say, and, and technology, of course, tilts us this way, and that's something else that Del Noche spotted. I think te- uh, technology shapes the way we imagine the world, and it allows us to imagine a world that has no transcendent significance. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we uh, before we get to the specifics of uh, the problem of atheism, Carl, what I what I'm interested in is when you look at his body of work, what are the essays that you would recommend to people? Uh, starting with the ones that made the most impact on you, you may, you mentioned uh, on the ascendance of eroticism, which is a, a terrific essay. But were there any other pieces in the in his body of work that were particularly impressive for you? Yeah, I think the well, the latest volume that I've been digesting this last week since you kindly sent me the PDF. I think this is fascinating, particularly his interaction with Nietzsche and his his seeing Nietzsche and Marx as kind of. Mm-hmm. I've always tended to see them ultimately as being on the same place because I think this idea of negation and the idea of the transvaluation of all values, I think those are a very close idea. So I'm at the moment wrestling with, with what Del Noche is saying about the division between Marx and Nietzsche and, and processing mm-hmm. that. But I think this latest book, to me, is the most fascinating of the three. Carlo, uh, it may be the most fascinating of the three, but it's also the last one that you translated, even though it was his earliest work. Why did you work in that in that way? I mean, you translated his most recent, then his second most recent, and then um, his earliest work, which is actually, in his view, his most important work. How, why did you approach the project that way? Which was to introduce a uh non-strictly scholarly or technical philosophical audience to Del Noce, because I think Del Noce has an importance as a cultural critic that goes beyond the community of the professional philosophers. And so to do that, I try to do a little bit of uh, strategizing about what would um, be most helpful and easiest to understand. And I figured that the latest Del Noce, the last Del Noce, the Del Noce of the 70s and 80s, which was a critic of the society, which is already our society, essentially, would easily found 
the readership. Like uh, as Carl mentioned, his prediction in 1970, there is nothing to be surprised about the idea of homosexual marriages. You know, that's a striking example of yeah. detecting signs and following leads to, to certain conclusions that we are living today. So I thought that, that the latest was, that example. Was amazing, that was really an amazing part of his analysis to see that so clearly so early was quite striking. Because his method was to dig down to the deepest philosophical assumptions be, be behind the manifest, the social, public, visible manifestation. So, for that reason, I didn't start from the Problem of Athens because Problem of Athens was published in 1964, and he doesn't talk about the themes that appear later, like you know the New Left, the Sexual Revolution. Um, those themes really came to the fore in the late 60s, uh, after 1968 in Europe, typically. In 1964, uh, Pelnoce in this book summarizes his uh, intellectual trajectory up to the early 60s, which centers on Marx. I mean, he, pub he republishes all the essays on Marx from the late 40s, and then he published essays on 18s that are basically his answer to Maritain, his critique of Maritain. And he published uh, some heavy-duty work on 17th century philosophy in as much he thinks it's still relevant to the development of modernity. It is not uh, the easiest book to read. It is uh, over 500 pages. It is a combination of many different topics. It's organized in a very particular way because after collecting seven old essays, as an introduction, he wrote a 212 pages new book. <laughs> that's not a, that's not the way to sell books, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's not right. going it's not going to get a lot of readers, and so. Yeah, but you I, do, you, uh, Carlo, you do a good job of of providing a, a kind of a map through the through this text. That's yeah, thank you. That's, but I, uh, I, I did it with great care because I was worried. <laughs> I mean, as I said, this is a heavy-duty tome, and some parts of it will be foreign to, I think, North American readers, um, even to Catholic readers, because his, his understanding of, of modern philosophy is very particular. He doesn't think that Descartes is just a bad guy, period. Mm -hmm. He thinks that Descartes is an ambiguous guy that can go in different ways, and that actually, in some sense, is also the beginning of a Catholic tradition that started on the wrong foot, but did go somewhere 200 years later. I mean, it's it's a complicated book, so I didn't want to scare everybody, so I, I kept it for the third book. But you do regard it as his, uh, you would agree with him that it's his most important book. Uh, to understand the trajectory of his thought, yes, because everything is, the, the premises of his philosophy are there. I mean, I should be careful about speaking of premises of his philosophy because Del Noche was a historian of ideas. Mm -hmm. And he was a deep philosopher, but he never wrote his book of philosophy. There is no book in which he wrote my philosophy, right? I mean, you, you wouldn't find that even in Italian. And mm -hmm. His philosophy has to be, has to be what's the word, gleamed, glimpsed from, uh, from his essays on the history of ideas. I mean, there is a whole industry in Italy of uh, professors of philosophy who try to reconstruct what's the Noche's philosophy, <laughs> because he, he never wrote it down, you know, if, if, if you know what I mean. He really approach the understanding of philosophy and metaphysics through its historical manifestations. And uh, sorry, what was the question? I, I got sidetracked. No, no, you've answered it. Why, why, you've thought, why, why you thought that this yeah, was Yeah, okay. so for example, the, the premises are there. The, the, the big things that he never kind of moved away was his youthful discovery of the philosophical depth of Marx. Not just Marx as an individually important philosopher, but Marx as the full political fulfiller of Hegelianism, as the culmination of European rationalism, as the brother enemy of Nietzsche, right? I mean, he, the, 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 the importance of uh, Marx, uh, his understanding of Marx informs his understanding of atheists. To him, Marx yeah. is the prototype of the modern atheist, and the first one, he says, who developed the non-Christian anthropology, because up to Hegel, anthropology was still Christian and Platonic, mm -hmm. so he says that. So you see, you see the importance of Marx there. You have in the essay that you, I know you like on Western religion, the first yeah. appearance of the question of Western secularization, as specifically Western after World War II. And then there is the big summary of his vision of the history of modern philosophy in the essay on uh, Pascal and contemporary atheists. So, his fundamental ideas are all there. Then he's not applying them to the sexual revolution or to 
the new left or to uh, Euro communism or whatever, because they're not appeared, they're not happened yet. But his fundamental vision of the history of philosophy and of the birth of modern atheism is all there. So, yeah. Aaron, when you, uh, I want to ask you the same question that I asked Carl a moment ago. Um, in terms of uh, what essays formed your opinion of Del Noche? I mean, which were the ones that affected you the most uh, strongly? And uh, to the degree that you've had an opportunity to, to read or browse through The Problem of Atheism, why do you think it's an important book? Yeah, so I have read The Problem of Atheism. Carlo provided me with uh, chapters as he was translating it. Um, so I, I've worked my way through it. Uh, certainly, the already uh, both of the already published volumes were terrific. Um, I find some of his topical essays on particular uh, 19th and 20th century thinkers to be engaging in intriguing ways. I mean, one way into Del Noche's thought is to recognize the regard he has for Antonio Rosmini, for example, who is um, mm -hmm. a, a 19th century um, philosopher whose ethics provided a kind of counterpoint to uh, Immanuel Kant and the ethics that has dominated so much of the of the 19th and 20th century, and that ultimately probably doesn't work very well. Um, Del Noche, Car Carlo alluded to this, Del Noche doesn't have a sort of unitary view of the, the direction of modern philosophy. He doesn't see it as an inevitable um, uh, development toward secularism or atheism. He actually thinks there are two strands that can bo both be traced back to Descartes and ambiguities in Descartes. And one strand is the rationalism that runs from Descartes uh, to, to Marx that begins with an unproven postulate denying uh, the doctrine of original sin, at least implicitly in saying, you know, man's current condition is normal and death is normal. And if we can sort of uh, figure things out and work things out uh, intellectually or socially, uh, we can sort out the evil in the world. But the other strand uh, that is rooted in Descartes as a, as a kind of Christian philosopher runs through uh, Malebranc and Pascal uh, in, his, in his own way on down into, into Rosmini. He was an Italian philosopher in the 19th century. Uh, his essay on Simone Weil also, I think, is really terrific. It's the best thing I've read on her thought and really helped me to understand her significance. So I appreciate Del Noche introducing me to uh, new thinkers that I hadn't I hadn't read uh, very much of until until I read him. Um, those, in some sense, are are sidelights to some of the main themes in his work, um, but they also give an interesting window into his own thought and some of the 19th and 20th century thinkers that he thought were significant in terms of their own deepening of and recovery of an older classical tradition that, um, that that's eroded in in the in the strand of, of philosophy that moves towards uh, irreligion and, and atheism. Del Noche didn't think that um, that our task was simply to go back to uh, philosophers, whether it be Plato or Aquinas or whoever, who who were closer to the mark. And you know, memorize their formulations, and you know, put put that in our back pocket as though we had the answers. He thought that any of these thinkers were tapping into a truth that that transcends us and transcends any ability to formulate it perfectly. And uh, so, so tradition for him was not the past. Tradition for him was, in a sense, the the eternal, the vertical dimension. Uh, that thinkers of the past had tapped into in their own way and applied to the problems of their own day. But we have different problems in our, in our own day. And so Don Noche models for us what it means to think in relation to one's own time and to, to draw on thinkers of the past and to understand, especially the historical development of thought and the logical progression of, of ideas, but also to wrestle with problems in the contemporary world uh, drawing on on tradition in in his sense of the word, um, uh, in order to in order to try to try to do that. So uh, he wasn't just a historian of thought. He was he was someone who was always moving back and forth between uh, 
ideas and history and wanting to understand how uh, how historical developments influenced ideas, but also how ideas influenced uh, historical development. He, he didn't think that that capital T truth was something that could be sort of definitively formulated in human language once and for all, and then we're done. It was this ongoing project of, of deepening an application that needs to be continued in every generation. Carlo, the two uh, essays that uh, struck me uh, most in the problem of atheism were political theism and atheism, and then notes on Western irreligion. Two questions. Number one, why do you suppose he wrote those two essays? And uh, in your opinion, what are the most important essays in the problem of atheism? Well, the one on religion is because in the early 60s, he must have noticed that, that something new was happening. I mean, the, he had just written three years before this other essay called The Atheistic Options. Reflections on the atheistic options, in which he basically criticized Maritain for saying that atheism is just a response to the hypocrisy of the pseudo-Catholic or Christian bourgeoisie, and that if Christians were better people, people would not be atheists. That kind of, you know, that was uh, that's an oversimplification. But then, in, in the early sixties, he noticed that there was this new wave coming, a lot of it from the United States, in which really. Uh, People did not even care to deny God, as uh, Aaron said before. But there was this technocratic, you know, young Turks uh, mentality that we are going to organize society on a strictly secular basis. We are not even going to ask the question of God. And that was new. And so he, he had to reconcile it with his previous experience. So that's why I wrote that essay. And the essay on liberalism is uh, very provocative because... Uh, unlike a lot of other conservative, traditionalist, Catholic thinkers, Del Noche is not necessarily anti-liberal. I don't know if he would call himself liberal, because the word liberalism means too many things, in my opinion. But Del Noche accepts an idea of ethical liberalism, but whereby ethical liberalism means a political project that respects the human person. You know, every Catholic human project must be anti-totalitarian. So if you, if you are anti-totalitarian, in some sense, you are liberal, but not in the, in the sense of John Rawls or in the sense of John Locke or in the sense of any of these famous. In, in, in the United States, liberalism has a very secular flavor. The word liberalism has very strong secular associations, uh, not so much in continental Europe. So for further notice, there is a sense in which the question of liberalism is the question of anti-totalitarianism. And he thinks that there is, again, an association between, on one hand, totalitarianism and atheism, and on the other hand, between this ethical liberalism and Christianity. I think that it's in inevitable for Christianity, in some sense, to affirm the imago dei, the, the divine image in people, and that politically, this brings some notion of respect that in some sense could be construed as liberal. And, and so, and so, yes, he, so he struggles with this, uh, this problem, so to speak. And, and, and he comes to the conclusion that, you know, that really what makes the difference is not the opposition of conservative or, or liberal in the American sense, but what he calls perfectism or perfectionism versus anti-perfectism. Basically, basically, whether whether uh, he quotes the French philosopher Renouvier from the 19th century that says that basically all political options organize themselves about how we answer the question of original sin. I mean, there are political positions that recognize an intrinsic human limitation and he, he calls them ethically liberal, uh, non-perfectist. And there are uh, political positions that don't recognize a fundamental human limitation. And so liberalism itself is split into perfectist liberalism and non-perfectist liberalism. And to him, the, the, the threat, the danger comes from this perfectness, from perfection, from, from this lack of sense of the limit, so to speak. So if I'm going to pick up this book and read it, what essays are the ones that you would recommend? And this is a question for everyone uh, that we're talking to here. Um, what are the essays that are most important to read um, in in uh, the problem of atheism? Well, um, 
As I said before, it's a big book with a lot of material, and some of it will be very exotic to some American readers. So the last thing I would recommend is to read it from cover to cover, unless <laughs> you are a... You can, but for, 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 for the average reader, uh, I hope that the introduction can be of some help. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I, I hope that the introduction can help uh, people orient themselves. And at the end of the introduction, I provide a alternative table of contents uh, because the, the Noches table of contents is frankly useless. It just gives the title of the seven essays. One of them is 212 pages, but you wouldn't know from the table of contents. Um, and so what I do in the introduction, I provided uh, a list of uh, the best bits uh, of the problem of ATs, what I call selections for the problem of ATs. And if you follow that list, uh, the first impact will not be too traumatic if you never read the Noche before. Yeah. Okay. If you read the Noche before, it will be fine because you are used to his uh, style, you know, it's a little bit uh, sometimes dense, a little bit Italian, a little bit... But if you appreciate the Noche before, you can read the whole thing. But yeah. if you are if you have never read the Noche before, I would recommend first to start from the Crisis of Modernity because it's an easier book. And when you get to the problem of is to start with the selections that I suggest. Carl, we're close to running out of time here, but I mean, what what would you want to communicate to people who are going to pick this book up and the rest of the body of work of uh, Del Noche? Why is it important? Uh, and, um, you know, where do you begin? Carl or Carlo? You, Carl. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My colleague, Carl. Yeah, well, two things. One, I think uh, Del Noche offers a very interesting account of the history of philosophy. Uh, of the essays in the in the new book coming out, I would say the one that I found most interesting was the very first one on uh, the concept of atheism and the history of philosophy. As I say, I'm still chewing through uh, the account of Nietzsche and Marx in that, but I think that's an extremely... It could stand as a monograph. I think it's a very helpful account of the history of modern philosophy. Secondly, I think he represents one of those thinkers a little bit like Philip Reef, and perhaps a little bit like Nietzsche as well. If, if He has a vision of what a world without the transcendent will look like and what the implications of that are. And that's where I find him so insightful because I think that's the world we're living in at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found him as a sort of a, a, a second fiddle to Philip Reef, really. I'm always haunted by, Reef makes this statement somewhere that no society in history has ever attempted to justify its ethical codes purely on the basis of itself. Mm -hmm. That's the society I think we're living in now. And I think that's the society that Del Noche in his own way was also attempting to, to analyze and pointing towards the dangers thereof. So I would say in this latest volume, that first essay, but I would say if, if you've never read him before, The Crisis of Modernity, yeah. that was the book that I read. Mm -hmm. And I think I first heard Carlo speak at a seminar that you ran in the Archdiocese. Right, track. yeah. Uh, and that it was that seminar that really switched me on to reading, reading mm -hmm. this man. Aaron, what about you? Yeah, I would begin with The Crisis of Modernity, and I believe it's part two, the collection of essays in part two. If I'm remembering, Carlo, there's three parts um, that you, you've you divided it up into. Uh, begin with part two, always read Carlo's introduction. This is the problem of, the problem of atheism. Oh, th this would be with The Crisis yeah. of Modernity. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably the most accessible. Uh, Age of sec Secularization is also more accessible. I tackled uh, the problem of atheism uh, from cover to cover because I, I, I got Carlo's introduction to it last after I got the other chapters more or less in chronological order. But I had read the other two books a couple of times already, and so I had some context in which I could, I could put the problem of, of atheism, and I knew where he was going with some of it. It was still a difficult book. Um, but if I were to go back and, and do that again, do the problem of atheism again for the first time, I would start with Carlo's recommendation at the end of his introduction, where he says, okay, read this section, and then read this section of this chapter. And he sort of walks you through an abridged version um, and gives you a bit of a roadmap for that abridged version. I think I would do that abridged version first, and then 
you'd be ready to go back and tackle it cover to cover. <laughs> this all probably sounds very daunting for our audience. Um, I would encourage people just to dive in and start reading Del Noche, and it's going to take some work, but it'll start coming together after a while. Um, so I don't want to scare people off too much, um, but acknowledging that, especially the problem of atheism, is a, it would be a challenging book for a lot of American readers, uh, I, you know, I think is is important. But Carlos done a really good job um, giving you a roadmap through the book and the sections of the book that you might want to begin with. I, I found myself, uh, I think it's important to be frank about this because uh, I think it was Rusty Reno who originally turned me on to, um, uh, to Carlo's work and Del Noche's work. And I, I picked up the crisis of modernity and I have to say that it defeated me three times before I, <laughs> finally, before I finally got into the rhythm of Del Noche's thinking. And then I just got completely addicted yeah. to it. I mean, he, yeah. he's one of the best analysts. Uh, the ascendance of eroticism that Carl mentioned a little while ago is just a it's a fantastic essay, absolutely fantastic. So the effort to understand and uh, the effort to put time into to reading Del Noche is, is really very worthwhile. And I, I think you gentlemen have really helped whoever views this to kind of come to terms with the task and the rewards ahead in reading the in, in, in reading Del Noche and particularly the problem of atheism. So I'm very grateful for your time and I, and I hope it helps the viewers um, leads leads them into reading the problem of atheism and the rest of Del Noche's work. So, Carlo, Carl, Aaron, thank you very much for being with us today. Very grateful. Thanks.